in this series of communication theory. For those of you who've been around, we've been working on this process since 2015, this time around. There were some other meetings a, a few years back, but uh, the latest iteration of this process of really getting a feel for what revitalization looks like for Go to Gate Village, we've been at it for since 2015. Um, as a result of a year-long me year meeting in 2015, the working group that was made up of a lot of you here in the room, residents who live in Golden Gate Village, other stakeholders in the community, what came out of that process was this, this notion of, let's explore the viability and feasibility of two options. One is an historic preservation option, and the other is a mixed income option. We, we were tasked with exploring those, those two options, again, through a working group process, including residents and other stakeholders. A request for a proposal was, was developed. And what a request for a proposal is, it's an opportunity to go out to the, to the business world and say, who can come in and help us figure out this feasibility process? Who can help us come in and really talk about what makes most sense? short term and long term. In that process, there was a company, CBR, that I'll present in a moment. They were, they, were, they were selected through this community process to come in. And um, last month, they had their first meeting. Raise your hand if you were at the first meeting. Very good. I'm so glad to see a lot of you come back. And, and they deemed this as a listening session. They wanted to hear what, although they had some historical information on what had occurred in prior meetings, they wanted to hear what, what's on people's minds. And so we had meetings and we talked about this whole notion of both plans, trying to get from people and they have a model, they look at economics, physical, and the social aspects of any change. Tonight, they're going to, after listening, the first meeting, they're going to get into the physical and the economic aspects of both models. They're going to talk about the physical conditions of the building, Golden Gate Village or buildings, I should say. They're going to talk about the economics. What dollars are available to support both plans, the mixed income plan as well as the uh, historic preservation plan. And so we want to give them an opportunity to just go through this process and share with you the information that they found out. And this information came, a lot of it came from the resident council who, who submitted the historic preservation plan saying this is something that we like to see happen. We want you to explore the feasibility of this. Where are the dollars coming from? How hard are they to get? How easy are they to get? On the other side, the mixed income, same thing. Where do the dollars come from? How hard are they to get? How easy are they to get? And then we'll talk about, you know, the, the social aspect, you know, the notion of, of being here in Marin City and, uh, you know, what, what that means that it relates to the so social piece of it. You know, everything from education, life expectancy. <coughs> There's a uh, document called The Portrait of Marin. I don't know if any, has anyone ever heard of that, Portrait of Marin. It's a study that the Marin Community Foundation did that really talked about some of the inequities and injustices, if you will, as it relates to how things happen in the way of economic opportunity, education or opportunities health and social opportunities, the difference in living in Marin City and living in other communities. So I'm going to turn it over to Dan to, um, to kick this off. But right before I do that, I, I, I wanted to just give some clarity to something you may have read in the newspaper the last couple of days. And that's this notion of the resident council or resident uh, plan has submitted a application for historical designation to the State Historical Preservation Office. <coughs> the Housing Authority is responding to the, let me, let me say this the correct way, so the application has been submitted. The Housing Authority doesn't have a position for or against the submittal of that application, okay? The Housing Authority has an issue with the process, not with the resident plan, we have an issue with the process that the state historical preservation has not, in our opinion, followed. Their regulations say when an application is submitted, 
And if it's not submitted by the owner, which is us, <coughs> that they are required to do a number of steps in the way of communicating to the housing authority about the application, giving the housing authority the opportunity to see all of the documentation that goes with why they felt this application was worthy of viewing. And the issue that we have is that we don't feel, based on their process, that this has been followed. So I, I just, it's so important that I mention that because I've read, well, the Housing Authority is against the Historic Preservation Plan. No, we're not. The Housing Authority has an issue, and we want to be more involved in that process versus, versus the State Historic Preservation Office just saying, here, this is it. And so we're in conversation with them right now, asking them to give us an opportunity to be an integral part of and of, of this process, and you'll hear more about that later. So, who are you talking about? The board of supervisors? No, we're not. I'll, 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 I'll explain that, it. That's who you work for, the okay. board of supervisors. Yes, ma'am. You're not working for us. You're working for them. They're supposed to be working for us. They're not. They're a bunch of racist Republicans who want this property, and we want to put moderate income housing or whatever here, so we will slowly disappear. We need to have historic preservation. We need to keep something. This was excluded from everybody in the county. We were the only ones to get this piece of property. The other people, they moved all over the county. We couldn't do it. Now they want this because it's more accessible, it's more beautiful, and it's not fair. And you, coming here from Chicago, where they tore down dastardly places like Cabrini Green and Robert Taylor, that should have never been built in the first place, you got rid of that. They didn't want you in Chicago after that. So they brought you here. Oh, this Negro can do this in Chicago? He'll do it here. Nobody checked your background. God sent me to know who you are. I lived on the south side. He didn't have that problem. But you are a problem. And I, we had nothing to do with you coming here. If you're going to represent us, do what we want you to do. Don't do what the county wants and what these white people who you represent want. <laughs> I want to know, how can we trust you? Okay. None of those people on that board lives in Marin City. No. So, and when I was a kid, hold on, let me finish. As a kid, none of my white friends would come here. Their parents told me they would get raped, robbed, or murdered. But now, look, all the white people are on the board. So how can we trust you? We can trust me by my actions. Can we see okay. your actions? And my actions start. Your you actions not done on the process. Chicago. My actions, you ask me a question. Start you can trust me Chicago. by my actions. Not by what you read or what you heard. You can trust me by my actions. And a part of my actions we're going to show right now. We, we again, we, we're being transparent. We're providing information. We are, we, we're, we're meeting and talking about what we're doing. So if we could, please. I got one more question. Okay. Who are the people behind you? You're going you're gonna to learn about that in, in one minute. I'm, I'm going gonna, gonna, gonna to introduce them to you. Very good. So why don't we have the team introduce themselves and we get through the process. Guys, we, we have to be able to work through the notion of just talking with one another. The best we want to know you're working us for us, us and not against yeah. us. All right. Well, I, Sarah, I'm, I'm sorry you feel that way. My, my actions in this community speak a lot of different. A lot different to what you may feel. And I'm determined to continue to, we can sit down and talk individually or as a group about, about the actions that, that I've demonstrated since coming here. And let me be clear, I've demonstrated those actions working with people in this room, okay? I've got demonstrated those actions working with improving the conditions of the property. I've, I've demonstrated those actions 
working with our school here. So there's a number of things. But 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 I remember in the parking lot is not approving. Okay, very good. So Dan, why don't we and, and sir, we can have some conversation, but we need to let everyone else hear the presentation, and we hope you stand here at all. So Dan, why don't you introduce the case? So good evening. I have a little bit of a sore throat. I'm going to do my best. That not a problem. Are you contagious? No. Um, we are consultants. We're not on the board. I'm an architect. With me tonight is Tanya Dempsey. She's with CSG Advisors. They are financial analysts. Their specialty is restructuring assets of public housing communities. Because public housing communities are underfunded in our country. That's not just an issue here, that's an issue all over the country. So that's what their specialty is. Next to time there, Jennifer and Zach, there was CPR. CPR is the lead consultant on this team. And they'll be going over some economic analysis tonight. And with me is Kevin from my firm. And so we are consultants that are hired for this. The purpose of this meeting tonight is education. We are going to be bringing new information to this process that hasn't been disseminated or discussed. The outcome is we're hoping that you will learn something about this process that you did not know before. And we'll be asking that question at the end of the meeting. No decisions are going to be made tonight. This is an information session where we're bringing you education. Okay. The way we're doing that is we're going to do a short recap of the meeting last month. And then we're going to break into three sections. The first section is a physical analysis. The middle section is an economic analysis. And the third section is a social analysis. That's what was advertised in the flyer, and that's what we're doing tonight. So you go to the first slide. So here's our agenda. Those are the three sections we're going to go, and then we'll finish up the next steps. And we will also have a raffle at the end. There's also daycare being provided down the hall. If anybody needs that during the meeting. If you go next, Kevin. Go ahead. So one thing we want to make sure you understand is that our starting point, or the guiding principles of the community working group, <coughs> number one, goal is no displacement. Everything that we're doing tonight and everything that we have done since we arrived is respecting that number one goal. No displacement. So regardless of what you read, regardless of what you think has happened in the past, as consultants coming to this project, that's the number one goal. Everything we're going to show you tonight is in step with that number one goal. I want to make sure that that's clear. Next one. So we developed some project goals that really align with the community working group goals. And if you look at them, it not only includes what I just said, it talks about respecting the history of Marin City, going back to Marin Ship and earlier, and the history of this public housing environment. The respect here is also something that we have focused on from the very beginning. Go to the next one. Uh, Lewis talked about the meetings that had gone on before us. There were also meetings before that. But what we wanted to touch on was uh, the meetings that we had in June. We had a packed house here in June. About half of you were there. In addition to that, we met with other stakeholders on Tuesday and Wednesday of that week. Go to the next slide. These are who we met with in June. These are the stakeholders who are there. And if you go to the next slide. All that information now is on a website. So if you go to this website. Did you read off those stakeholders' names? Yeah, sure. You can't see them. Thank you. Sorry. Go back. So we divided this up into different categories because these were called listening sessions. And we wanted people to 
give us their understanding of their relationship to Golden Gate Village. Number one on that list was the resident council. It's at the top. Can you read that? Yeah. And obviously the residents. Then we went to nonprofit people. People who either provide services or are in the community. And can you read that or would you like me to read it? So you can see she lived there. Women Helping All People, Fair Housing Advocates of Northern California, Legal Aid of Marin, State Area Legal Aid, Nests, Architects, that was Daniel Ward who did the uh, analysis, Bridge the Gap, and First Baptist Church. Thank you, Dan. You're welcome, I'm sorry. What is Nests? Nests is, um, um, and Dan, what was Dan for me? What we did was we took notes from these meetings and we put it on a website for you to look at. Yeah. So the next so slide. This is here. I want this wisdom from that. You know. Excuse me. I'll talk to you later about that. But that, that I like to talk to the person who was sitting with that information. Yeah. It was uh, our team. So afterwards, you're saying we may have missed some of the things at the meeting. I missed some things and I'm missing. All right. We can go over that. <laughs> so we took notes from those meetings. Those notes are now on a website, so you can see the topics that are discussed. As far as local government officials, uh, the Sheriff's Office, Health and Human Services, County of Rain, Willow Creek Charter, <coughs> the librarian was there. Well, I have a question on that. Was the Marin City Community Services District invited as local government officials? The CSD? Yes. I don't know. Who would know that information? We can find out. They were invited. They were invited. Yeah. They were. They were invited. As was the C. C. Yeah. All, all of these. All, yeah. They were invited. Yeah. All right. I'll be here. We then visited the Marine Marine Community Foundation. Uh, gave a little uh, presentation in front of the MHA Board of Commissioners. And we might have with some staff people from planning just to understand um, zoning and situations like that. Okay. Go to the next slide. Um, so if you'd like to see the topics that were discussed at that meeting, it's on this website. Also on this website is the video from our gentleman over here of the first meeting, as well as the slides that were presented at the June meeting. <clears throat> we will also be putting up these slides on the website next week, or later this week. Okay? I'll wait until then. Good. Next slide. This was a process, <clears throat> excuse me, that we did at the June meeting. We just wanted to show this for a moment. We did this process where we asked people to complete the sentence, I wish Golden Gate Village dot dot dot. We didn't ask anybody to sign their name. We didn't say who they were affiliated with. We just want to get a sense of some of the diverse thoughts that were in the room. Kevin, you just... Um, so that was someone's thought. They wish Golden Gate Village would become a model community dot dot dot. If you go down, um, this one, if you can zoom into this one, that we can get funds, handle our business, and be left alone. Does that sound familiar? Yes. Right. Okay. So we recorded all these just as a way to get an understanding of what was in the room. It's a representative sample. It was only a small percentage. But we captured that, and you can read that at your leisure. Okay. Next slide. Uh, July meeting is where we are right now. We are planning to reconnect with some of those people that we met with in June to update them on the information that we're giving to you tonight, which we think will be also an education for them. So we'll be repeating this with these stakeholders. We're also going to meet with the resident council twice. We met with them before the meeting, and in June we only met with them before the meeting. We want to meet with them again after this meeting, so we have a second meeting with the resident council. 
Now. All right, now we're going to get into the analysis, and this is part of where the new education and new information is going to come in. And we're hoping that with these facts and the evidence behind them and the transparency and spirit that we're giving to you, that this will be new information for you to try to understand what a future vision would be. So we're going to start with the physical. Go to the next page. So tonight, as we look at economic analyses, economic analyses are really based on two factors. What things cost and how you're going to pay for them. Right? It's basically how redevelopment works. What are the costs and how you're going to get the money. Now, if you look at what are the costs, there's one cost that is bigger than any other cost because there's a lot of different costs. The biggest cost is the construction cost, right? That's the number one largest cost when you put together 20 different types of costs, including architect's fees, legal fees, accounting fees, things like that. We needed to get an understanding if we were doing an economic analysis, how much would this cost? The way we did that was we went to physical needs assessment also known as a PNA. The PNA is a requirement of public housing developments to do every five years to take a snapshot of the condition of the facility. It has very strict guidelines. Consultants who do this are educated in the process, they're trained, and they have a series of actions that they put together for this. The last PNA done for Golden Gate Village was 2015, relatively recent. Part of that analysis looks at the life of all the components in a building and how long they're going to last. So basically, when they go and visited the units and went around the buildings, they took heed for how long the windows were going to last how long the roofing was going to last, how long the boilers were going to last. And they put together a giant spreadsheet that actually went out 52 years. Because in their analysis, they know some things you do don't last 52 years, even if you're doing them in year one. So when some of those items actually repeat. What happens when you don't do them at all? They get worse, and they get worse, and they get worse. And they get more expensive because every time that you don't do something, tomorrow's cost costs more than today's cost. So it's already 2017. Nothing really was done. 2009, 2009. And you go all the way back. Keep going back. This is a problem not just with Golden Gate Village. This is a problem in our country. All houses. Public housing is severely underfunded. Can I ask you a question real quick? Yeah. <laughs> is it takes, it, do you take into consideration the maintenance and the landscape? We don't have anybody cleaning up with that one guy and who spends more time at the uh, bait shop buying alcohol so, than he does <laughs> cleaning up. The other thing is we don't have the landscape is atrocious. You couldn't live in anything like that. If you had a lawn, it would be a lawn. We've got weeds. We could have poppies growing there. I mean, that wouldn't bother me. But weeds? That's, that's disgusting. And we have a, a director here that rides through, and I guess he's oblivious to that. We, the money that they want to spend on construction could be spent on remodeling, revitalization. You know, the things that need to be done. My house was flooded with this much water because a 40 or 50 year old water pipe broke. And everybody down, coming down that hill at 49, I'm at the bottom, they got swamped. The site utilities on your campus are deteriorated and need to be replaced. That is, in, that is in the physical needs assessment. But when we went through the physical needs assessment, 
We also found there are things that weren't there. The extensive landscaping. Issues with site drainage. Issues having to do with some of the remodeling that was done on the high rise. So one of the things that we had to do is to take the physical needs assessment and try to bring that up to speed. And we did two things with it. First thing was easy, and that is we escalated the cost from 2015 to the year in which we think this construction can happen. We had to pick a year. So we're in the middle of 2017. We picked 2020. We picked that year. So we took these costs and escalated them 3% a year to 2020. Easy calculation. The more difficult calculation was trying to update this to the concept of a deep green retrofit. The PNA replaces items that were in the building back in 1960 and maybe have been replaced once or twice with those same items. If we want to do, according to the historic preservation plan, <coughs> deep green renovation and historic preservation, we need to take these numbers and lift them up a little further to be accurate. It's not going to do anyone good if we keep those numbers artificially low. We would not be representing you. So we took those two escalations, but <clears throat> this is the most important part. When we looked at the spreadsheet and we added up all the items in the first column, which was work that had to be done right now, okay, it added up to 16 million. If you're a reader of some of the blogs around here, are talking to people and they represented that this is a $16 million project. When we want to give you education tonight, it's much more than that. The reason being, the table continues all the way to 52 years out. And although we didn't go that far, we had a quick stopping point. We looked at the data, we looked at when the major components are going to get replaced. We have to go 20 years out. Because eight years from now, you have million dollar boilers that need to be replaced. So to make a long story short, when you take all of the numbers that went 20 years out and collapse that into this needs to be done now, no more putting off maintenance, no more saying it's tomorrow, but we have to do it now, the number goes from 16 million of hard construction costs to 50 million. $50 million of hard construction costs is the cost that we're bringing to you. This is new information based on this. And then that gets escalated based on some other items like engineering fees, contingency, things like that. Total cost, $63 million. So if you've seen $16 million in the news, that was correct for year one. Let's plug a hole in this, you know, so it doesn't deteriorate further. But if you're doing this project and need to have a long-term solution, it's $63 million. But you got long-term alternatives that could be interjected and in could reduce a lot of costs. For example, building, what we talked about, a green manufacturing hub where you create employment. We'll get to that. Yeah, but, yeah, I mean, this is a raw number, so all the way up to 63 million, and it's a barrel of stuff that's in between. So uh, what Ricardo's bringing up is there's money to offset that. So remember when I said there are two columns that development looks at. One is costs. The other are the sources to offset those costs. Tonight, we're going to go through all those sources, just not right now. So we'll be there. Okay? Because we need a way to pay for this, right? If we're going to do this, we need to find the money. That's part of our presentation tonight, just not right now. Okay. But without the new construction, it would only be 16 million, right? No. No, so let me clear Does that up. Does that out. include the, the new construction? No. So let me make sure that this is clear. I appreciate the question. I really do. The $63 million is to historically rehabilitate all of the 
three, 296 existing units, no new construction. And that is based on the data that is in this document, adding up the numbers for 20 years, which we think that's supportable, and just escalating it to 2020 numbers, and then increasing that 25%, which is the number that we can work around. Remember, what we said tonight is that we are doing analysis. We're not making decisions. These numbers are gonna change. But what's happened here, there's a lot of numbers that are spinning around. Our goal is to just stop the merry-go-round for a moment, just for a moment, to see where we are. And we're gonna give you insight into those scenarios tonight. So dude, I just want to, well, I want to Sorry. clarify something, something that you said. Okay. Um, the 63 million is replacing the stuff that you have in your apartment right now. Right, that's what that number represents, right? So it doesn't represent any, you know, you, you sort of mentioned the support rehabilitation, which will cost more than the 63 million. The 63 million is really saying, we took, all the things that are in here, and we're saying, yes, we are going to upgrade them. We are going to bring them into you know, a, a state of good repair, and we're not just going to replace them, we're going to make them better. That's what we're saying, OK? That is not, that is not sort of uh, re preserving the, the it's not building the and the facades in that historic, it, with a historic designation. That will increase this a little more, and we'll show you what that increase is. Hold on. We're going to do this one at a time. Would you start at the foundation first? How are those structures? How are those structures, though? It seems that everything that needs to be replaced are the structures themselves that were pretty well designed with good materials. They haven't deteriorated that much, have they? That's not going to be a major part of the cost, is it? Correct. So when you think of it, you really have to look at two parts to that. The high rises and the low rises. High rises are cast in place concrete. Low rises are concrete block and wood framing. The high rise structure is more or less sound, although there were some repairs on it. So the costs for that are really all the systems. The boilers, the piping, right. the windows, the doors, the roof, and all that stuff. And I want to make sure, I think I said this, but I want to make sure. There's a note in the physical needs assessment that says there's drainage issues on your property. We don't know how much that is. It should be studied. So part of the 25% that we added was not just the study, but actually doing work to solve some of the drainage. Right, but I was, my question was about the structures themselves. The structures are sound as far as we can see. There are some units that are not as sound, 100 and 200 units, you know, over uh -huh. on the edge. But for the most part, the PNA did not identify structural damage. Right, this is not like any other public housing. Correct. Right. Right. You find nationwide, you know, so we're really trying to preserve what there is instead of. Correct. What was your name? Ruby. Ruby. Ruby Wilson. Ruby, go ahead. Yes. Um, you right. say you're going to replace everything inside, but you say the piping and all that. So you would start with the foundation, right? Because putting the court, the, the cart before the whole course. You would actually, we'll get into this, it would be done in phases. <laughs> you can't renovate a 300 unit. $50 million project once. It will be done in phases. When that phase is done, we'll get into that part of the discussion tonight. They will be doing all the site utility work, all that landscaping, all the paving, all the drainage, all the site lighting, as well as the exterior, the building, roofing, and all the interior systems. So it's a total project. What should yeah. end up? Um, and then Ali, you're right. <laughs> That's to make sure we come back at the same rate we left. It's actually better. But, right, but you get a better, you get a better quality unit. Yes, that's how I'm saying. At the same rate, of course. Roy. Right. Yeah, but and I, I'm like Ricardo. I think some of it is um, inflated because it's, it's about 210 if you save 300. The 210 thousand dollars per unit per cost. 
So, I mean, so you take away part of that for the, you know, the landscaping and all of that, blah, blah. But if I, as I look within my, where I live, my unit, I know what it needs. And I know that it needs new uh, electricity, new uh, uh, drain, uh, plumbing, and energy efficient with, from the roof on down. But that's not a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollars. So uh, I'm thinking some of this is sort of inflated. The spreadsheet that is part of this is a math exercise. So the numbers actually add up to the totals that we're telling you tonight. The only thing that we added was the 25% to cover things that aren't in there. Aside from that, the numbers are all there. So they all still, you have to do is add them up. We went through that from the 215,000 P in A. What is the difference in the cost from the 2012? The first one was done in 2010. So they're, yeah, so they're done every five years. We haven't analyzed that. Because that would be something we're analyzing. Yeah, and I think that you're right. What you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, I think that you're totally right that between 2010 and 2015, if nothing had, if, if, if nothing was upgraded, then those costs, you would expect to see those costs be higher from 2010 to 2015, right? Yeah. Right, right so because I think, things deteriorate. Exactly. Things deteriorate, and the cost of those materials went up, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I think, I think right now we are using the data that we have available to us. You know your apartment. But nothing else. And I, What's on with 2010 is probably still on 2015. It's possible, and those exactly. costs would probably be higher. And we can certainly show you how the cost has increased from 2010 as a result of And then when I saw what you said with the ESCO, which was money wasted. So you got to allow for, you know, a few million dollars of waste. Well, I was actually more thinking that I, I you know, we, this is what we have available to us now. You know, we are in the middle of testing out what's feasible. <laughs> and this is what's available to us today. Is right. this the best tool? No. Right? If we were really to be serious and have a substantial plan, we would be doing different types of analysis to get to what those real costs are. But right now, we're not there. Right now, we are using the data that is available to us to give you a sense of what we think is feasible right now. And Ultimately, that's what we you'd be hiring architects, engineers, yeah. structural engineers, general contract to, to describe scope of work and get it exactly, right. but in the feasibility stage, and again, I want to make sure we understand this, mm -hmm. we're just doing mathematical analysis right now based on the data out there. And what we learned, at least by reading some of the articles, a $16 million number has been thrown out. Tonight, we're telling you that that is not the number. And I think I see people no. saying that that number is really 63 million. Correct. Yeah. 16 million was only the first year yes. of hard costs, not even taking into account soft costs mm -hmm. or boilers and things that need to be repaired two to 10 years from now. Okay. Sorry. Uh, just tell me the first thing. Yeah, uh, you say that the buildings are sound, so I assume that means they're up to current earthquake standards? Mm -hmm. We have. That's a good question. Part of the PMA. Uh, ask for seismic analysis to be done. That has not been done. So, so we can't tell you that it's according to part of the seismic codes. Yeah, we have this one house from the fault and we're over here. Yeah, I understand. I appreciate that. That is actually in the report. Um, yes. Me? Yes. Okay. And then, uh, Vet, did you agree? Yeah, I'll go next. Okay. And then you can go okay. okay. You? Okay. okay. Go ahead. I, I see that one thing or three things that we need are all the cabinets, kitchen cabinets to be replaced. That's going to be a lot of money. All the doors and um, thresholds. And then, huh? Renovations. 
and then floors. Yeah. Now, I'm from Chicago. The floors in Chicago, for the most part, are wood floors. People would move in, sand the floor, put varnish on it, and that was it. Our floors are uh, tiles, vinyl, and they break, and they don't get clean, and you can't put polish on them. They're, they're terrible. Even though we're living in public housing, you know, I, I think people think that we're going to evolve to not being in public housing. But for the most part, we've been here for, I've been here 40 years. That's a long time to be somewhere. And I know that it can be done in a better way. I know it can be upgraded with all the money that we have. People in Africa and other countries, they don't have this. We are blessed at this point, but we need to have it upgraded for the money. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. And that's, that's exactly why the number is higher than 16 million, right? The number's higher because we don't want to replace your floors exactly the way that they look now, right? That's why the number isn't 16 million. And so I think that's what we're trying to sort of get across is that we were thoughtful about what, you know, what, what those costs might be. Again, right now these are assumptions for feasibility purposes. Right. So we did, but, but you know, you should, you, should, you should rest assured that we were not contemplating replacing things 1960 style like they are. Oh, right. You could say 2015. So we're going to go to a So I just read that the Marin County Civic Center is going to have its roof replaced for $22 million. Right. So if it's $22 million just for their roof, and I've worked at Civic Center, I've worked there for five years, and I, you know, I've seen all the money that goes through. If anyone doesn't know, I'll tell them about it. But 63 million doesn't seem like very much for no. close to 300 units when you're talking about 20 million. We didn't million say it was. Yeah. Right. So right. our board of supervisors yeah. needs to be told where they need to put money in Marin County for the people who deserve it, who are human beings. Yeah. And yeah. Right. Are going to be able to stay here. The number one goal was 
on the very first slide. Remember what I said? Right. But I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. But this is that's the reason of my question. The second point is the fact of being mixed income. For working families like myself, Marin County is extremely hot. Like, below market rate is $3,300 for a two bedroom. So what happens to the safety and the security of where I have built a home in this community? If, in fact, we tear down and we have to go somewhere else until it's complete, will we all guarantee have 100% and our, our unit. I've raised my child here, and that is important to me. I would like to know, regardless of whatever it is that you guys have decided to do, and me speaking from coming from somewhere else where property was way worse and the neighborhood was completely horrible, I want to know what happens to us. What happens to the mothers and the children like we have here? Are we going to be able to still call this our community? Or will it be completely revamped like the shopping center? The answer to your question is yes. The answer to your question is yes. That's all I understand. Right. That's the same round. That's the same round. That's the same round. That's the same round. Let me address the question. Let me address the question. You know, one thing that's been burning in my mind, and I think it should be burning in everybody else's mind, is like, who's going to own this property? You know, we're making a, a $53 million dollar investment. That means banks going to own it. That means funding institutions are going to own it. And all of them have demands. And all of them have conditions. I was sitting over there when we had the same players come to the table and literally take the land from Marin City. They broke land leases. They did everything that they could do legally to turn the properties over you know, to their special corporate interests. And as a result, this community is losing millions and millions of dollars of revenue that should, every kid in this community should have a scholarship waiting for. Every person shouldn't have to worry about houses or, or, or owning their own units. And if you get to the place where you stop thinking about ownership or who's gonna own that land, you're gonna, you know, you're defeating the, the, the integrity of the community. And the community should be about it's worth, it's equity, what it builds up is ownership and whatnot. You can't promise them that $63 million investment is not going to yield, you know, some level of ownership managed by people within the community. I think we're going to move on to the next slide. Okay, we're going to now switch to the economic portion we're actually going to show you the financing scenarios. And the way that we're going to do this, did you have a question? Very quick. I'm sorry. If you could please at some point provide a plat map or survey of the 33 acres, where are these buildings are? Oh, we are? have that. Yeah. Is that here? Uh, it will be. Yeah. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, let's go to the next slide. So, our goal, and again tonight, there's no decisions being made, it's about education. We were hired to look at both options and to come up with different scenarios for each of the options. So we're going to go this through historic preservation first. We're going to show you four different financing options. Tanya's going to go over how we're going to do that. During that time, she's going to take a moment try to educate all of us as to some of the some of the phrases and some of the terminology that's used in development finance. We're going to try to do that so this will make a little more understanding to all of us. Um, go to the next slide. I'm going to leave this up to you. Okay, okay so we talked through the 63 million, and I know that a lot of you have questions about what makes up that 63 million. We're gonna walk through some of these some of these costs. Okay? First, it's construction. So we talked about that, right? That does include labor to install and to do all of that. I know that you have a question, I wasn't sure if we addressed it. Um, the next cost is demolition because we did look at a scenario where there were some buildings that would be demolished. 
The next is land and it building. Be if this story preservation. There are, we ran options. a lot of scenarios, right? We ran a lot of scenarios. Well, you said we were at four for historic preservation. Four, right. So yeah. it's historic preservation. Then there's zero. The oh, map right. the so cost so is zero. We're just going over the terms for the rest of the presentation, which also includes scenario two, which we looked at. We'll say it's scenario two, but you're okay. talking about. Yeah, we're talking right now just about scenario one. Okay. Land and building acquisition. That is the value of the land that's here and the building. And that number is based on cash flow. Okay? On what? Cash. Uh, on how much money the property generates. Okay? How much do you think each building is So, so, so it, we, I estimated 50000 per unit, which which is uh, about thirteen million dollars, thirteen point four million dollars. Which, building. which no, for the total, which could be again, you would get an appraisal to actually refine that number. That number is a placeholder. Okay. Contingency. So because we are at a very early phase in our feasibility and planning, we have contingency built into the budget. So you were mentioning earlier that you think it's a little inflated, right? It is, because there's some contingency in there because I don't know what I don't know, right? So I'm building in a little fraction in case there's something that we discover going forward. Does that make sense? Um, yes. Yeah, uh, can you go back to land and building? Acquisition? Yeah. What does that mean? Wiring to the land. Um, well, he asked who was acquiring the land and building. Right. Right? Land and building acquisition, the way that we have modeled it, is both a use and a source. Right? As it relates to, you're doing historic preservation now. If, so if you were doing historic two, preservation, hold on, if you're doing historic preservation, and you were using tax credits, okay? And that's, I was gonna get to that. Well, I'm talking order. about demolition costs, land and building acquisition. Yeah, land and building acquisition would be, I would use that actually as part of historic preservation. And the reason I would do that is because in order to utilize the tax credits, there's um, an opportunity for investors and developers to partner with the housing authority to preserve all of this. And in order to do that, you would you would use a source and a use and that would actually generate more money for you. So that's that's why it's in here. It's both a source and a use. How? Right. How the source and how the use. No, no. Right. Um, yes. I still don't get it. Um, does the acquisition mean that transfer of ownership from one entity to another? Yes. Yes. So what are the entities? Right now, I don't know what the entities are. Where are the costs going down? I'm sorry? The cost. Yeah, this is right. So, so this slide right here, what we're going over are just the definitions of and assumptions of the, the the cost. It's still confusing to some that some of these things like demolition and such. We were doing a segment on historic preservation, right? And it seems that people aren't understanding why some of these categories are being included in the cost for historic preservation, right? Such as demolition, etc. Land and building acquisition. Yeah, land building acquisition. That was be, yeah. Those are strong words for historic preservation. It doesn't seem like that. Is yeah, part of the so it's demolition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. on the inside of each unit, if need be. Is that part of demolition, or is that taken down? Right. Again, this, this is the definition component of the presentation. So we're literally going through all the sources and defining what they are, because you're going to see them again in upcoming slides. Well, that's what you should do. It. Okay. Yeah. Don't do it about. Okay. Do you want to talk about the sources? Yeah. Yes. How right. is it a source entity? 
wanted to know. And the cost for that. How is it a source that you can answer that question? I Okay. Okay. So here, all right. So so here you see a seller note. This is right? Right here? MPHA seller note. That is basically the value of the land and building acquisition put back forth into the project as a source. I got one question. How much is the land worth? What is the estimate that we're using? You got an estimate. How much is it worth? I I don't know. Well, what's that? Thank you, Megan. This is part of the vulnerability. Right now, what we're doing is we're trying to educate on what. You're not what, educating us because y'all don't have facts. You're just telling us <laughs> possibilities. We want to know. We want to know what's really going on with our community. But we're not there yet. Why are you not there yet? You're coming to our community and telling us you want to break this down, but you're not there yet? That doesn't make sense. God, that's what they were paid to do, is just give us possibilities. That's yeah. really all they're here to do. They're Housing. They're not well, yeah, that's doing it. That's what the issue is. But see, they're here for a They will get more specifics once it's decided which direction the community wants to go. But I did have a question yeah. about the third place. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I don't know because we ran it specifically for your requirements. Yes, from a nationwide from a nationwide perspective. These are these are concepts. Exactly. Excuse me, just to get us to understand. You guys are going to sell the property, right? If we don't know what it's worth, it's like having a car. You know, sell it to know what it's worth. Why can't there be a different approach to the privatizing? 
trying to promote this particular program to transition from public housing to fixed income. No, yes, a rental assistance demonstration right. program. Right. So, yeah. so, so the reason why that's important is because when you combine the subsidies that HUD gives you into one subsidy, they allow you to use that money to raise debt. Okay? And raising debt, bringing in additional income, helps pay for the construction costs. And that's the difference between public housing, traditional public housing, and, and, and RAT. And I will tell you that they learned some things, HUD did. And they tried to maintain the same resident rights that you have today when you transition to RAD. Okay? Now, again, the key, the key principle here is that it allows you to raise money, to, 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 to borrow. It allows you to borrow money, which you cannot do now. And so you are at a considerable disadvantage because you only get $300,000. What are you going to do with that? She won't even be able to fix her floors, just as they are for $300,000. Right? So the purpose of borrowing money is to let us reach our goal to do something. Yes, Correct. to get you a little bit further along to get you to your goal. So that's, that, that's, that's one um, funding source that we have modeled here. The other funding source is a tax credit. Right? So there are a lot of different tax credits. There's an historic, a specialized historic tax credit, which actually allows you to rehab your building. It gives you a special designation, and, and it allows you to rehab your building. But, but, but in doing that, right, but in doing the tax, right, so, so what is a tax credit, right? I want to know what entity gets the tax credit. That is a great question. So in that kind of in, in that kind of model, the organization has to change. Okay? So the organizational structure today is that HUD and the housing authority hold the title to the property. To right? So HUD and the housing authority, they own Golden Gate. The land. Okay? The land. The land. They own the land and the building. Right. right? So in, in a historic preservation scenario where you're utilizing these tax credits, right, in order to do that, you need someone to buy the credit. And that person who's buying the credit takes ownership of the property in a, in, right, in a new entity that is between the investor and the housing authority. And in that scenario, the housing authority, right, still, in order to even engage in that kind of partnership, the housing authority can say what type of investor it wants to be in business with and what those terms are and how those terms impact your for, lives. For instance, very low income in perpetuity or whatever. So rad, I'm so happy Sorry. that you said that. I it out. So it's the rad hard contract hard. is different <laughs> from other contracts because it automatically renews. So there is a clause in the RAD contract that basically says that you as the owner, right, are going to be offered and you must accept the contract in perpetuity. That maintains the affordability of this property for as long as the HAP contract is in place. So does the community land for us? And I could swore that when we talk about preservation, that one of the options was to create a community land trust that's owned by the people there, and there's a whole different funding pipeline that goes along with that. Uh, are we not talking about it? Or is that off the table? Or should we not think about that? But it gives a, it gives equity back to the community, and it gives equity back to the uh, to that neighborhood. It's not off the table. In fact, it's a requirement of our services. <laughs> if there's 250 land trusts around the nation and they're growing every day and they don't go through nearly the type of problems that we have, but it's hard work, it's hard work in maintaining and getting them going, but it does provide that type of investment for people to own their own units and, uh, 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 and, and characterize the 
neighborhoods the way they want. They can have community gardens, like I said. They can have uh, 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 manufacturing hubs. They can do all these type of things. But the basic premise is the land is owned by them. Understood. And we are hired to study that, Ricardo. But why is, is that one of the scenarios? Uh, yeah, why no, is it's not a part of it? Let's ask the same question. No. It's not part of tonight's presentation. Why? It, it oh. never is. I mean, well, no. It's, it's supposed to be because it's a part of our plan. It will be. And we went through that. It will be. Yes. Yes. We're going back. We got immediate needs over here from the uh, and if people that spoke about having immediate needs. How do you address those and ease into what is the people's choice? Is, pre is that preservation issue. We want to preserve. We want that historical legacy that had, you know, came all the way down from World War II. Right. But, but, oh, turn it around a little bit. Just, and not only. Do you have a question? I'm sorry, Craig. Did you said that every five years someone comes in and looks at. Okay, so how come all of a sudden all this stuff needs to be done? Why was nothing done yeah. during that time? Because we only had three hundred thousand dollars to do it. Okay, well, well, this, this is the condition I've been The number now is lower. We continue over the years. Excuse me. The number over the time would have lowered. We continue over the years. This is like a problem. I mean, it's a mess. And all of a sudden, you know, they all went over the years. Really? Over the last 20 years? Really? Over the last 20 years? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I drove around before I came here and said, this is just a shame. Just really a shame. But then all I can hear, Lewis, well, we'll do better. Because people want to We'll do better, you know. And so that $16 million, you need to uh, look at what can that $16 million off the P&A, what can it get us now? Really, because after looking at this, no, what we need, I'm like crazy. You talk about 20 years from now, I won't be here, so uh, Hello. now, now, $16 million, what is it saying on the PNA for us now? And can I just address that for just yes. a second? So, so let's let's uh, I will play I will play it out. Let's say for 16, 16 million, some of that work is interior. So it's um, you know your kitchen cabinets, your floors, it's all of that. Let's just let's just assume that. In in, in two years from now, we're going to need to replace all of the plumbing, which means all of no, the work you that you put in. You're doing your priorities wrong. Right? You need to do the infrastructure first. Okay. The where our houses aren't flooding, where crap is not coming out of the kitchen sink. So if we can get that, that done. could go to maintenance, which we desperately need on a continuous basis, and landscape, which we need. Because those are the things that Royce is alluding to, making the place look good. From and even in our houses, even with the in plumbing, houses. the electrical brought up to the 21st century and codes, start doing some energy efficiency stuff. And, and I just oh, want to say one more thing. Can I say one more thing? I know you guys are working for the people who hired you, the housing authority. I know they have a plan. It's just like uh, Kelly, whatever her name, Kelly Ann. Uh, that speaks for Donald Trump. She's <laughs> never going to say anything against him. Never. Just like you guys are never going to say anything against the housing authority. Everything that you say has to make them strong. Kellyanne is doing it, and you see her every day. You know, talking up for Trump and, and, and being his spokesperson. He is too unintelligent or unevolved to say anything. So respond. So to she that. does. I would like people are making a better argument than Kelly and Maybe. I'm just saying. I would hope. But you want to be a, a thank you very much. That's all that matters. No, I mean, I, I, honestly, I, I think I think your all of your your issues are, are valid, right? You're you're upset because stuff hasn't worked, and I think what we're really here trying to do. Is, is figure it out. I don't think that there's anybody in here that has a plan. I, I can tell you I certainly don't. And, and, and part of this is really to get feedback and to try to figure out what's going to work and what's not going to work. And, 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 and look, here, historic tax credits. We ran a scenario that, that includes historic tax credits. Historic tax credits means that you need to change the ownership entity and you need an investor to purchase the historic credits. So I think we're trying, and, and, and in doing that, you have an opportunity. You have land that's valuable. That's right. That land goes right. into this transaction, and you get historic tax that's credits right. for it, right. Right? right? And then you take the money that you are earning, that's and right. you lend it back into the project. That's right. That's the acquisition, and then that's the seller. There it is. Right? Yeah. And so we're yeah. trying. We are really trying to make these scenarios work. This gap is, and I think it's 27 million. This is smaller. 24 gap. million. Look, this gap is smaller than the 63 million dollars that we started with. Yeah. Right. This here is is actually an opportunity. That's it is right. an opportunity for us That's to right. work together, That's right. so that we can try to solve this gap together. Right. And that's, that's why we're here. Right? right. There is no master plan. At least I don't. I don't have one. I don't know if Kelly Cott, Kel, Kellyanne has one. But I don't have one. And, and, and I think I think this scenario. Look, we have a scenario that has no gap. Do you want to hear about it? I don't know if you want to hear about it. Honestly. Is it the 
around. Because this is a crazy idea. And I don't know if you guys want to hear what the crazy idea is. So, I, I, you know. You might as well. Yeah. We you want to make sure? Yep. Yeah. 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 But just hear yeah. around. Right. Yeah. All right. Letter. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So New York's here. Right yeah. here. Here's no gap. And this is a project-based voucher scenario. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why? You mentioned something very telling earlier. You said it is, you know, thirty-three hundred dollars to rent an apartment, and, and we only pay three hundred. So how do we compete? You can't. You can't without additional subsidy. That's right. And this scenario says, okay, so if everybody gets that subsidy, right, which means your rent doesn't change, but the rent that we get to build to rebuild right. the building, right. that changes. And guess what happens? There's no gap. Zero gap. Right, $63 million worth of work that you want done gets done in four phases using a project-based voucher. Now, what are the pitfalls, yeah. right? Because you're actually coming out of public housing and changing your subsidy. That's what happens when you have a project-based voucher scenario. So we change over the way. Okay. And then you don't have opportunities for homeowners yet. And, and right. well, I don't know necessarily that that's true. I don't know enough about that program to tell you that that's appropriate or not. But what I am saying to you is that there is an opportunity to get to 63 million. And, and look, that still has an acquisition. It still has a tax credit investor, right? But it does, it does give you, at least it gives you Hope. But does it protect our rent levels so they don't increase? Well, so for on the section on, on that program, on that particular program, you still pay thirty percent of your adjusted income in rent. Okay, so it would be the same. Yes. Okay. But However, there are different rules. rules. There are different rules for that program that aren't as advantageous as, say, a rental assistance demonstration, like a RAD unit. The the RAD subsidy gives you, protects you more than this scenario, but it also doesn't give us enough money. And what's it? Right? So those are the kinds of trade-offs that we're investigating. We're really, right, and, and, I, and I, again, I want to say, I don't think that this is contentious. I think we're on the same team. And I think we're trying to figure out how to get all of the work that you're trying to do done. And that's actually, that's part of, that's, that's part of our feasibility. And so, you know, I mean, I think you want to go to the, the next. Um, I guess I've had some. You guys are with me. Seems like you guys are with me. In terms of the, the, uh, the last year scenario for. Yeah. Um, why is there a $9 million. Nine million. I can't. Oh. Nine million. What, here? 96 million. And then the other one's a hundred. Yeah. So what is that? This, you Where did, this? I mean, why did it? Why is it higher? Yeah. Why so is it higher? The historic tax credit scenario increases the cost because of exactly what you said earlier. You said that when you have the historic designation, you have to follow, you have to follow different rules, That's and right. that costs more, yep. right? And again, that, so, so you have a gap right here, but this gap is a lot lower than this gap over here, That's right? right? Yeah. Okay. So, okay. All right. Is different. They just throw a gas. Exactly. They're different programs. So, so this one is, is a RAD and it has um, it has a, an ownership partner, uh, yeah, uh, investor here that utilizes 4% tax credits. So uh, there's some costs associated with actually doing that kind of transaction, such as setting up the organizational partnership, and you have actual legal fees to try to figure out what kind of rules we're imposing and which ones we're not. But this is the historic tax uh, yes. that's two years. So it's in here. It's in here. It's in, it's in the sources. So you have, you have RAD, you have 4% low income yeah. um, tax credit. Yeah, so I layer, we layer the historic tax credit and the 4% on top of each other. To but get you Yeah, so, so actually what happens is your cost went up. So the credits that you're using for that program actually get minus out of the 4% tax credit. There's a little bit of a differential there, but I think it is definitely added. At this point, we're going to talk about phasing for a moment. 
Okay. After we talk about fit and these guys are going to come up and talk about some of the sources that would fit with that. So what happens with the historic preservation model is if it's between 60 and 100 million dollars to do, it has to be broken up into phases. Typically four phases for project size. If you take 300 units and divide that into four phases, that's 75 units being renovated or rehabilitated at once. That means 75, 75, 75, 75. One of the challenges that we face is where do those families go during the six months or so of construction? This type of work is not work <coughs> that can be done between 9 o'clock and 3 o'clock in your apartment. When you're talking about investing $20 million or so in each phase, that part of the site is shut down from a safety standpoint, from a site development standpoint, site utilities. We have a responsibility to try to find an answer to that, but it's not easy. If you think about Marin City, and if you think about Marin County, we have to find a place for 75 people four times over a two-year period. That is a real challenge. It's also a challenge to find a place for 296 or more people if it's all done once. Yeah, we can't do it. We really can't do it at once. It's a challenge. So I want to make you sure that you understand that even though there are some financial scenarios that look positive here, we still have the aspect of relocation. Now when we talk about no displacement, if you renovate this property, people will have to go somewhere while that property is being redeveloped. Now we don't have to call that displacement. Temporarily, they're going to have to leave this site. That means families, children in those families, would have to go to new school districts. Other working people would go to areas that they can find this. But to identify those 300 places over a period of two years is a real hurdle. So at the beginning, when we talked about trying to bring some new information to you, this idea of phasing is a very, very important part of this solution. If we cannot figure out the phasing and the temporary relocation, this becomes much more challenging. Either way, though, even if it was the, the other option, people would still have to go somewhere. No. So I'm going to segue to that real quickly. Under the mixed income option, which is option two that we haven't looked at the scenarios, if you use the numbers, <clears throat> that we were going to show you. So I'm skipping ahead here, but I want to answer your question. We would be building some new units because if we have no displacement, we're required to have 296 public housing units, no matter what we do. To have mixed income, we need to build something new. In the mixed income option, if we were to build a building for 110 units, I'm just picking that number, and I'll show you why I picked that number in a moment. <coughs> you can actually build that first, and that building would become the temporary relocation for the rehabilitation of the rest of the property. Mm -hmm. Because a building that's 110 units doesn't take up the whole property, it takes up a piece. Now that takes away some of your open space. So every one of these has a connection. And one of the things we're trying to do tonight is show you all these dots so you can begin to connect them. But if the mixed income scenario has temporary relocation figured into the project, it means nobody has to leave Golden Gate Village during the construction period, unless you choose to. You would move into this new building. Some people might choose to stay there. Others would then move back to their apartment at the same rent that would be entirely refurbished. So there's a big difference between 
option one and option two in regard to relocation. We're not saying that option one cannot happen. We're saying it's more challenging because we have to find 300 spaces somewhere in this community. Right now, that's very hard to find. But you already did that. <clears throat> Go ahead. Building in the Ridgeway apartment, you already built. So what do I want to do right now? We're going to move to another Okay, we will get to that. There's a part of our presentation that we really want to get to. And that is an, is an analysis of the sources that we research to fund these gaps. We need to do that tonight. So I'm going to ask Ken and Zach to come out to go through those sources, and then we'll go over those questions. Are we are going to go through the mixing? We are. We're just trying to get there. Okay. Um, so we've heard about we've heard about um, a lot. We've heard about the scenarios. You've heard about the gaps, and what we've done is. We've taken, we've taken the nine sources that were provided to us by the Resident Council, and we did the research on them. And um, I know that someone mentioned that we were one-sided, but this is part of our working relationship together. So the option one, um, we went through the nine sources that were provided, and we're going to talk about those now. I think just if I could add on that, I think what we did here is we didn't necessarily, we didn't run for a form us on these. I think we're still in the preliminary process. I think the main thing we wanted to look here at um, was just a high level view. So we wanted to see if these, if we were competitive for these funding sources and if we were at a base level eligible for them. So that's the, the purpose of this review. And I think as we further refine our analysis and come back to you at our next meeting, I think we can have a clearer sense of uh, how these sources could play out in an option one or even an option two. So, so let's talk about what they are. The first one is Federal Historic Preservation Tax Incentive Program, also known as Historic Tax Credits. And we've heard about that a lot tonight. Um, we know that historic tax credits are used to renovate um, an, an historic building. We know that. We know that um, a store tax credit will need to have an investor <coughs> and ownership change. We know that, okay? Um, what else that? We also know that, um, oh, when we go through all of these, we're going to talk a little bit about the sources that seem conditionally viable. We know that historic tax credits are conditionally viable, and we'll talk about that in a little while. I think I would just add that just the nature of the credits and the, the requirements of them, what we noticed when we were doing our research and just based on our experience is they actually increase the cost of the renovation. That's right. so there are certain requirements because of the historic designation that would increase those costs. Um, I think we, we, the reason uh, Jennifer used the term conditionally viable is because we want to make sure everyone understands that with a historic credit, you do have to change the ownership entity and you are bringing in an investor. And that wasn't something that we thought was contemplated in the original resident plan that we reviewed from the community work group. When you say bring it a new change is what can be shared. Sure. sure. So yes. this, this is only a source okay. if someone buys this tax credit. Right. And that's an investor. Right. And so if the investor is only going to buy that credit if they have an ownership interest in the property. Yes. So, and I don't think, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to go through these and say this is based on our experience and our research, and we're not, we're not here to tell you this is wrong, this is right, we're just showing you what we found and just offering some considerations that can be used to further refine the rest of the thing. Okay, the next one. Go ahead, So, this is um, an interesting one. It's actually specific to the state of California. Uh, this is one that Boyce and Reese will share with us also. Uh, they offer competitive grants and affordable housing loans for compact, green, transit-oriented, affordable housing development. What we noticed about this one um, is that it really emphasizes the incorporation of uh, green infrastructure improvements. Uh, they, they tend to like, based on the, the awards that we've seen made for this, 
and just some of the, the criteria for award, they like projects that are a part of an overall comprehensive community plan. So they like for you to be working with stakeholders in your community, so your transit agencies, um, other government entities, to create something that's broader than just the affordable housing development itself. So one thing that we thought when we were looking at this source was that it would also, if it's a loan, would also require a change of ownership entity because you cannot currently put debt on public housing units. You can't do it. HUD regulation, federal regulation, Congress won't allow it. But if you did transfer that ownership entity and you changed it. I if I look that up, do I find it? Where can I find that? Sure. So we can actually share some information on the website with you that relates to that point. I want to find it, not just on your website. I want to find it somewhere else. Sure. So I think Tanya can even speak yeah. to that. Son is our financial consultant. That ACC, there's regulations out there, and we, I don't know the exact uh, 24 CFR code regulations number, but we can point to that, and I can provide it to you maybe even after the presentation if we can find it. So I think another thing to, to note here is there, that... Isn't there some sort of way, though, in terms of you saying changing ownership, that the ownership could be... Uh, transferred to the resident council as a nonprofit and hook that up and it's a way to work it. So the platform of the housing would have to change. It could not be public housing. But but there is you're right and we want to further explore that. I think we're not prepared to explore that to the extent that we would we feel comfortable doing tonight. But I think that we do want to look at that further. So one thing I will say is across the country we haven't seen too many options where it's worked, but we want to work with you to find one that could potentially work. And I think you're talking also about a, a, a non-profit uh, sourcing. You do have that help in the community. So we have, yes, ma'am. So the you're saying the change in ownership, that means both HUD and the Marin Housing Authority would be giving up <coughs> ownership and it would be transferring to... Not necessarily. So, so they would give up sole ownership? They would still have an ownership interest, but that ownership interest would be reduced. They could still maintain control depending on how it was structured. But currently, we can't have debt on a property that's should, public housing. I think you should look, um, look at it as a partnership. Right. Well, yes. well, yeah, yeah. But they don't know yet. But it's there a case that there's a case that we sent to uh, Daniels of um, the Daniel Town Homes on Capitol Hill of Washington D.C., where there was. Uh, the rest, their resident group, it was intricate financing. But the bottom line, they were able to, uh, HUD gave them like, what, a 99-year lease or something to that effect. And then where they were having limit, what, limited equity, like co-ops, and it was all based on their uh -huh. income. That's your extent right Uh-huh. Mixed income. Well, based, yeah, based on, a mixed income. right, a, a mixed I, I income. Mm -hmm. But we're still talking about mixed Mixed income coming from within, not coming, you know, from within. not from that new building. Right. 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 I think we're in the back of the yeah, I, I have a quick question here. Do you know what the current value is, assessment of the building and property at this point? So we would have to do an appraisal, and any time you would actually go forward from this, this feasibility study process, you'd have to say, what we've done is an estimate. And you probably showed that earlier, it's $13.4 million. Dollars. Say per building, right? Yeah. 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 Where the building? Excuse me. The, board excuse board me. the house is across Nothing. the highway are worth ten million dollars each. Okay. Okay. You have right. the size of one building. So this Just the property. You can't be right. You guys are you sell us out, man. And
this group would have to be made in order to make this source file. Uh, one thing we wanted to note is that HACLA, so Los Angeles, was actually able to get this grant, uh, which was awarded at a level of $11.9 million for multiple phases, but they, they had a partnership with the larger community to do a mixed income redevelopment of Jordan Down. Okay, so the next source that we were given was this idea of echo districts or eco districts. So this is actually uh, something that was given to us on I think really, uh, from a presentation, a slide from a presentation. What I would say about our research from eco districts is it's not a funding source as much as it is an idea, a planning tool that really strives to garner equitable and green development for your redevelopment and works with partnerships in the community. But going back and trying to find a source that could potentially help this rehabilitation gap, we have the California Energy Commission. They provide a number of research and energy conservation grants. Um, and we found something within those grants that they provide called the Enhanced Infrastructure Financing District. This is something we believe could be included, but it would be another conditional source. So it's basically, if anyone's ever heard of the TIF, tax increment financing. Um, it would redirect property taxes within the community toward a specific redevelopment effort. Um, the one thing to note about this, though, um, is that it would take away from other things within the community that would be funded by this property taxes otherwise. You know we've got problems with property taxes here, don't you? I, I, you know I don't know that yet, but I, now I do. <laughs> okay, so I would call on that. Okay. So that's something we're, we're, we're looking at competitiveness and we're looking at eligibility first. And then as we, as we narrow those sources down, then we'll run some performance and see how they could be incorporated into uh, performance that would fill these gaps we talked about earlier. So you don't have any examples of how this is working? So we, we have the awards that we're given. We can share the projects that have been awarded this before. Um, but, but yeah, we don't have anything specific to this project. So one thing I will also note is that this would also require approval um, from uh, the issuance of bonds. Any bonds issued as a part of this process would require um, local approval um, from local I'm not exactly sure, but I can find that out for you. Yeah, I'm not sure what the approval is. I just know there would be a local approval. So this would be on the issuance of bonds. So we vote? So the people would vote? So the county, county would vote, yes. Would vote to help us, OK. Mm -hmm. Or Just like any other type of, uh, I don't know if you guys do um, any voting on taxes, self-taxing for uh, transportation projects. Yeah, so, yeah, so I don't know how that would work in, in this county per se, but it would require so it's a county foundation. Yes. Okay. So the next slide. Number four is new market tax credits. This is another specialized tax credit that is... Um, um, uh, uh, sort of, it's not like the historic, but historic tax credits is a specialized kind of tax credit. New market tax credits are another type of tax credits. And this source was also um, given to us on the list. Um, the thing about historical, um, I'm sorry, new market tax credits is that it is not used for rehab. It is mostly used for economic development. Right. Or commercial. So if this would not help with the gap, on uh, on this property, on this property, on this property. This would only help with if there was another component, commercial component to this develop redevelopment. Then we could use this. But this that, could only that is be why used. it was given because when we gave we gave the complete plan, which included economic development. Exactly. So that's and what that would, was for. This would be a viable source for that's, that. That's why it was given. Yeah. Right. And, and, and we appreciate it. And that was good. And all, all of the um, sources that you gave, we did a thorough research on. One thing and that we one, but I was just saying, that was the purpose okay. of yeah. that particular one. And, and we actually like this idea. So I think that one of the things we talked about is this idea of job training. Um, it's come up in the previous meeting we did in June. It's come up um, even in the resident plan as documented by the community working group. And one of the things that you can do is you can create a job training center using new market tax credits. Right, right. So you have a mixed use component. Right. But, but that's, um, I, I think one of the benefits, and we can talk about this later, we were given a list of sources. And I think if we had a written plan that showed how all these were incorporated, we could better present. 
just so we understand, this wouldn't work on the gap, but it would work on other portions. That's right. That's right. Like a daycare center, a grocery store. Uh, so thank you very much. Sure. All right, so this is actually pretty cool and um, it's relatively new in the United States. Um, and, and thank you for sharing. Well, I think you actually shared another article that's today by um, Social Impact Box. So it's actually an innovative approach to finance um, social welfare programs. Um, basically use private funders. And so these funders are repaid by local governments as programs deliver on the intended goals. So you also have to have an investor in this program. One thing I'll note, similar to the new market tax credits, is it doesn't fill the gap for your rehab. What this can be used for is maybe a resident program. So the reason for that is, is it's very atypical for a rehab of a, of a project to be able to have measurable outcomes. So what are your outcomes in a social impact bond just by rehabbing uh, a public housing unit? What are you doing socially that, that can show a measurable outcome? Employment, but that would be an employment program. Mm -hmm. You couldn't do, you can't make a direct connection between the rehab of units and employment. Well, one thing we have the process of measuring equity. Well, and that's something we can talk about first. We're in the process of measuring equity in all of your social systems and mm -hmm. added value to those social systems. But how do you find the numbers? Well, so you, you, make up, you make up the number and you measure it over a period of time so that you can track it. I, I, I think what we want to present here tonight about this source is it would be atypical. It doesn't mean it's impossible, but so far it's still very new in the United States. That's do it in Europe. Than what I'm about. Sure, but, but what I'll say is, is it's just atypical and we haven't seen it before, but I think we can look at it further and see how it possibly could work. And I think we need to do that together as a group to see how this source could be incorporated into a larger plan, whether that's in the mixed income approach or in the, the historic preservation approach. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, you, you use the term private funders. What's a private funder? Because you also use the term investor. It would be an investor from a bank. So they would they would loan the project money. Okay, so it's a loan. Yeah. Uh, okay. And so they would be repaid by a local government. So the local government would have to be involved in approving the project. And they would be repaid as they deliver on whatever the, the established goals are in the contract. How much interest? So an investor yeah. has an ownership stake. And this is really just a funder which funds the program, yeah. provides the money that's necessary in order to make the program work. It's actually a really cool tool, and I, I think it could be utilized for things like resident programs, like we talked about, employment programs, job training programs. But I don't know that it could be, and you still have to figure that out, right? But I don't know that it could be used for the rehab of a public housing or even an affordable housing development. Right. Well, we can we'll work that out. I think we should talk. No, yeah. Okay. Instead, instead of yes, jobs, mm -hmm. we need to have some business opportunities. Okay. Because when we That's had the flea reason. market, they had promised that the businesses would be community owned and operated. Mm -hmm. Never happened. Sure. We need to be able to have some type of business venture opportunity. I agree with if you. If they're going to build anything, mm -hmm. let it be a business uh, component. Sure, let's explore that option. I think we want to work together and try to find solutions that work for this community. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and, and we were talking last night and also today about that we need like eight different references for our, our uh -huh. did, you, did, you, did you go to all of them? We did, and so that's what we're doing here. Did you, did you speak with the, uh, the strategists that we have? Did you, did you, did you contact we talk, Are you talking about Risa Jenkins? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So Dan actually met with her, and he oh, yeah, by the phone, by phone, I guess. And um, we were given the list. No, it wasn't the time I was on the phone. Oh, uh, yes, yeah. Um, so we because actually. I, uh, I just want to add. Sure. That, um, you can have generic solutions, mm -hmm. but if you have, you need to have the necessary relationships to leverage those. I absolutely ones. agree. That's so important. <laughs> Thank you for that. So this next source is Arcus. Community Development Investments, our Community Development Investments, CDI program. So we actually contacted our place. This program's really cool. It's not a program that could be used to actually fund a rehab, but it actually is a, pro a planning program. So they give you money to plan and see how you can incorporate art into creative placement. The thing about this program is, is it no longer exists. We 
contacted them, they say our CDI program doesn't exist. But they do have a similar program by a different name called the National, uh, the, the National Data Placemaking Fund. And they do similar work. So I think I would encourage whatever, after CVR is done with their process, I would encourage any further effort to actually utilize this because I think it's a really cool way to further plan and garner support from local stakeholders for whatever project you're doing. But I, I, I would like to clarify that this program would not fund any gap for construction. I, I would also, if we could go back one second, I would add that this actually was awarded to a housing authority uh, recently. Um, it's, they don't get very many awards, it's highly competitive, but actually a housing authority in Alaska actually was awarded this for a mixed income redevelopment effort they were doing in Anchorage. Um, and like I said, it's a planning tool, so they were using it for planning, to garner support from stakeholders, to come up with a transformative plan to incorporate art into whatever redevelopment effort they came up with. Okay, so this is something we were actually given um, by Royce when we were here last time. So we received a budget office cost estimate. It was dated 2015. It makes reference to House Resolution 3114. And the bill was intended to provide funds to the Army Corps of Engineers, to hire veterans and members of the Armed Forces, to aid in the curation and historic preservation activities um, related to federal owned art, so federal owned historic objects. The act actually became a public law, so that act is in law. And it, it's kind of unclear to us, and I think we talked about labor and voice, I, I, it's unclear to us how this source would actually relate to the resident. So we were given the source. Relates, yes, ma'am. Uh, it relates in terms of the <coughs> 15 to 20 million dollars to do the deferred maintenance. For, so actually labor costs, is that what you're saying? Yeah. So it's just, and it's based on um, being a special project mm -hmm. so that it would fall under that uh, to do Green, the green renovation retrofit based on the precedent of the Aspinall Courthouse, okay. which is our precedent that we use. So one thing that's different with that project and this project, you'd have a really, and it's just a consideration, just something they explored, you'd have a really hard time finding an investor or a lender that would feel comfortable hiring unskilled laborers to do that. So if you're going to garner well, other money for the, well, for the work... But then that goes with... Uh, apprenticeship, you know, apprenticeship programs. So sure. What you're saying then that would eliminate apprenticeship programs. But no, that this is an opportunity to actually uh, have fifteen to twenty million dollars to do to do the renovation work and to as it relates to green. Sure. One thing I would say is that I, I think the apprenticeship program is important. But I don't think it's going to offset your total labor cost. No, I'm not saying that. Sure. I'm talking about there's 15 million dollars mm -hmm. that was not spent in Marin County during that period of funds. Took us two years to do, or a year and a half before our congressman finally said, "Oh yes, it was there, but it's no longer there." And then that's when we showed them this. Yeah. So then uh, our congressman has told us that once Golden Gate Village is on the historic list, that he will go and push this to be a special project for the Army Corps of Engineers, as well as the rest of the um, various federal offices mm -hmm. that we have identified for money to push our entire plan. Sure. I, I think that's great. I think working with your congressman is really important. What I would say is, but this source, it, it doesn't have any more money. I think yes, if he could push, it, I think he could push a special project. But this was an Obama administration initiative. No, no, several no. Years all ago, that money, that exist. money went to uh, where they said that they had eliminated it. Mm -hmm. But it's a, it's about the obligation. That money is in where all of the uh, what, Ed, Obama money, A R R A. Mm -hmm. uh, went into this one pot mm -hmm. for the Army Corps of Engineers. Mm -hmm. So to do right. is what it says, 
to assist the courts in curation and historic preservation activities. Sure. And that's what they did with mm -hmm. the Aspinall Courthouse. Mm -hmm. Which was they yeah. renovated it. Mm -hmm. It was fifteen million dollars mm -hmm. So the challenge is that. Okay. I I think we've talked to we've talked to the congressman ourselves. And he didn't say that. Oh, he said the money doesn't exist. Mm. Oh, he said he told us that initially, yeah. but that money does exist. But what I would encourage you to do is continue working with your congressman. The, from the research we've we'll done, this money is no longer available, and I, I hate that for you because I think it'd be a really cool opportunity. But I do think you should continue working with him to to push for other monies to come toward your your community and to be used for this project. This just came. You see where it came in, in uh, 2015. Yes, ma'am. And so it says what it means to provide funds to the Army Corps of Engineers. Mm -hmm. So when, if if it's not doesn't exist, when did it? Uh, no, I. I I don't know that to be certain, and I would, I would hate to give you a wrong answer. We can find out. question on that. Say, hey, we heard you did this last year. Um, is there a reason maybe you're not doing it this year? And that's their position. Mm -hmm. So we will further explore that. But we okay. wanted to take a look at the, the PRIs and so, that's what we did. So we just wanted to let you know that we did talk to them about this. And I, this is our ninth one. Mm -hmm. We want to keep moving. We want to talk about scenario two. Okay? okay? 
So we wanted to let you know that we did do the research. Thank you for a lot of the sources. We do have but a very important follow-up. There's some more that we didn't give, so where are they? I didn't see. Uh, the only one was the Ford Foundation. That's the only one. That's that was the one that came in after. You know, no, business. you said this. We found some that aren't even. Oh, that's the RAD, the PVV. Those are the other sources. Uh, RAD, and the tax credits. Those are the ones that we brought to the table. Uh, the one with the no gas. But I would tell you, is there are others out there. So yes. the federal yes. yes. bank yes. and yes. other things. And yes. I think when we do our final analysis, all those will be incorporated to an act of that we can use them in later than within a financing transaction. Yep. Right. Yes. We didn't get a letter because now it's going to be an official asset. We're not looking for additional amount of money right now. We're just talking to them to see what they could potentially do. And we asked about their assets. So essentially, that slide is one for it to have the idea. We went to them with it. We went to them and asked, said, would you do it? And they said, we're not going to do it. Yeah, you should have to do it. That's still a viable option. It's potential. We still want to do it. That's why we're leaving on Wednesday. We want to keep working on it. Right, because the Rank Community Foundation has a very positive interest in growing the community. Sure. Yes. And they express that on that one. And that's why I want to continue to work with them and push them to potentially provide other money to support this project. Okay, we're going to turn it. We're going to turn it back over to Bonnie. AKA Kelly. Slash Kelly. All right, so, so we have four scenarios here. I'm going to go with it. Ready? It's not the worst thing to call. Um, okay, scenario 2X. Now this assumes, let's just let's just take a minute to just refresh, right? So we made an assumption here that the properties, that, that there are some properties that would be demolished to make room for a new property to be built, right? That's this scenario. That's why there was a demolition in the definition. So some, but not all. Some, but not all. Okay? Now, the, the one that are remaining, this is, this is a combination of a rehab of existing buildings. So the ones that, that are there will look like brand new buildings. So the people that are getting rehabbed aren't going to be slighted. But there will also be brand new buildings. Brand new buildings that will be built. That's what the scenario is. Okay? Do you want to make this Second. Increasing the occupancy, mixing income, adding the new units. Okay? This costs $167 million. Okay? The gap, if we use this scenario just with you know tax credits, right? Combination of RAD and tax credits and then some debt, you you have a $54 million gap. Okay? So there's a big gap here. Just want to be clear, big gap. Second scenario, right? Come down. This assumes, right, so this assumes, so, so this one was a 4%, right, where typically 30% of the total cost is, is paid for through an investor. This is a 9% credit. Now, 9% credit has 70% of the construction costs paid by an investor, right? Still change in ownership, you get more money here. Right? So if we did a 9%, this 9% to get four rounds of a 9% credit is highly unlikely. I'll tell you. But we ran this scenario because there's no gap, right? So again, change in ownership, very hard to get four 9% allocations in a row. Very, very competitive in California. But if we were to achieve it, no gap. So when you say change of ownership, who are you talking about on the end? Say, well, I don't know. This is the same. No, no. This is the same scenario where there's an investor and yeah, investor. And, and, a, and, so and somebody else, right? Smart. And right. somebody else. Yes. What's the scenario where public housing is still housing is already owned? Or? Yeah, that was, I mean, in all of these cases, we're not suggesting that the housing authority not be part of that structure, right? What we're trying to, they could be part of that structure. There's be nothing that stops us being, partner, being, being a part of the partnership. I have a question. Yes. Uh, 
Yes. What is the single house cost that you rent? One house. One of those houses. What's the average house? What's, what's the cost of the average house that you rent? Cost to build. Cost to purchase. Okay, so how is that only $13.5 million for the property? For the whole property. I'm, I was born at night, but that just makes me feel like I was born last night. <laughs> you know, if the house right across the street is worth a million dollars and we're looking at that property, somebody got a bad calculator. Is it because you need a lot of renovation and no construction? No, the property itself is worth more than you're discussing. Why are you, why are you underappreciated? Why, why is it so low? Why, 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 why are we having to feel like a kid? Like, we don't want to worry about it for parking or anything or how things run. Uh, 
Okay. Divest this property. We had a plan to use that land okay. to self-sustain itself, get the money, you know, do the, do the infrastructure work. Yeah. Uh, you know, all the stuff you need to do. Yeah. Would HUD divest itself of that land? In other words, take it the money was there. out of the ownership, huh? If, if, he he, he, I bet you if the money was there, they, they do do disposition. Exactly. Now, now, I've, been, I've been trying to get this question asked. Yeah. You know, there would is they? Could they? Could they? Yes, they could. could. They, can they? Yes. yes. Will they? Not nauseous. No. Yeah. It's not nauseous. There are these specific requirements that are met. Oh, I, 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 I can understand. Yeah, I'm making sure. Yeah. But it's called Section 18. They, it's the same process you have to go through for demolition or disposition. Section 18? Section 18. Okay, thank you. That, that's the best answer I got. But, but there are conditions that you have to meet yeah, in order well, to, well. to get the approval for this position. Right. And the housing insurer would have to put the application. Thank you. Well, We're going to hold up for now. I think it's raffle time. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for staying. So, just one more question. Yeah, so are all the slides, this presentation is on your website? It's on that website. It will be next week.